Bring that cannon over here, Colonel Mason. There's that weak point on that ridge over there. Tom, you go around with your regiment on the right. I'll come around from the rear. You men lay heavy bombardment until I give you the signal, and then we'll charge together. You understand? Who is that young major general giving all the precise commands with such authority and precision? Let's see if you can guess. He was born in New Romley, Ohio, December 5th, 1839 entered West Point U.S. Military Academy at 19 and graduated in 1861. 34th in a class of 34 students. Have you guessed? None other than the renowned George Armstrong Custer. At 23, Custer became the youngest brigadier general in the Union Army, and by the end of the war, he was promoted to be a major general. Custer was known for his courage and keen mind. During the Battle of Beverly Ford, Virginia, 1863 in the war between the states, Custer's commanding officer fell wounded in a battle. Custer took command never skipping a beat. He took the brigade with such great skill and imagination that they held their position in the battlefield. That's not all. A few weeks later at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, it was under Custer's command that they helped stop the Confederates. Jeb Stewart's attempt was to cut off the northern communication and to many historians, today they tell us that it was Custer that made the tide of the Civil War change from a losing North to a winning North because of Custer at Gettysburg. During those Civil War years, he had 11 horses shot out from underneath him in various cavalry action. And George Custer had the honor of receiving the flag of truce from General Robert E. Lee at the end of the Civil War, April 9, 1865. Despite all his success, Many thought that Custer was arrogant, proud, and he was either loved or hated by many. A former Major General of the Confederate Army, T.L. Ruser, said this good word about him in later years. Why? I never met a more enterprising, gallant, or dangerous enemy during those four years of terrible war between the states, or a more genial, whole soul chivalrous gentleman and friend in a time of peace. You know, I can't help but think of King Saul of the Bible when I read about Custer. Let's spend a little time now and learn about this first king of Israel. Like Custer, if Saul had gone to West Point, I don't think he would have been at the top of the academic level either. But when it came to being popular, Saul was the man for Israel. In Saul's early days, he thought of himself in a very humble manner. So when Samuel, the mighty prophet of God, was told to go and anoint him king, Saul answered, me, a, a king? I'm a Benjamite, the smallest of the tribes, and my family is the least important. I'm sorry, you, you must have the wrong person. That's found in 1 Samuel chapter 10. When the day finally came for the public anointing of this new king, you know where Saul was? He was hiding among a bunch of suitcases. But he was handsome and a foot taller than the rest of Israel. So when the people elected him king, he had no choice but to accept the position. And like Custer in the battlefield, Saul did prove himself well. He defeated the Amorites and Philistines on every occasion. On the next story, we'll hear more about Custer and Saul. But for now, let's see what we can learn from these two former leaders. Each one of us, I believe, has been given a responsibility in life to our parents, if you're living at home, and if you're married, you have it to your children and to your wife. And all of us have it to society. Above all, we have a responsibility to God himself. It tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, the following. Do you want more of God's kindness and peace? Then learn to know him better and better. For as you know him better, he'll give you much great power for everything you need to live a truly good life. He shares his own glory and his goodness with us. But to obtain these gifts, you need more faith. You must also work hard to be good, and even that's not enough. For then you must learn to know God better, and then you'll discover what he wants you to do. Next, learn to put aside your own desires so that you'll become patient and godly, gladly letting God have a way with you. The more you go on in this way, the more you'll grow strong spiritually and become fruitful and useful to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, dear brothers listening, work hard to prove 
that you are among those that God has called and chosen and that you will never stumble or fall away. You see, both Custer and Saul were elected to a high office of leadership, but in time they were found lacking in character. And it's interesting that both fell by the wayside, dying in a field of battle for mistakes committed in the past. It's not how important your job is, but how well you do what you're called to do. Let's say, for example, that your job at home was to take out the trash. That doesn't sound very important, but Dad and Mom's depending upon you. If you didn't do what you were asked to do, imagine the flies would come into the garbage and infest. Maggots would crawl all over the kitchen, and no one would come to visit you. You see, faithfulness to your calling is very important. First, to God's calling for your salvation, and second, to God's calling upon your life in the society that you live in. It's here, right here in America. In other words, God wants us both, all of us listening, to bloom where we're planted. Be all that God has called you to be. In the next story, we're going to see how Custer and King Saul failed and what they were called to do.